The Olympic Games introduced the splendor of Australia to the world. It's a continent largely untouched by time, full of boundless wonders. A land of awesome natural power, sacred symbolism, a natural canvas balancing splendid form and abundant beauty. Here at the dawn of a new millennium, time moves almost imperceptibly, going forward almost without a trace. A world away, time is a different concept, a force that keeps man and machine on a feverish pace. A century ago, an invention came along that took Americans into a dynamic new age, the automobile. Cars changed everything, creating a new freedom. A thirst for speed and unbridled power was spawned, accelerating time and the pace of life. From its beginnings as a machine with practical purpose, now a lifestyle, a world exists where competitor's resolve is fueled to ignore boundaries, to exceed expectations. Technology, design, and innovation merge with the human desire to go faster, push harder, defy time. As time embarks on another millennium, Australian tranquility clashes with international racing adrenaline. The excitement builds for Adelaide's race of a thousand years. Only the best will heed its call. Series Race of a Thousand Years. It's been 90 days since the Olympic Games ended and we left Australia, but now we're back down under 900 miles west of Sydney in Adelaide, a city of some 1 million people in the state of South Australia. Unlike the cold and frigid weather that dominates much of the U.S., it's summer here, a very steamy day, close to 100 degrees, the forecast high, and some 76,000 have come to ring in the new year with a huge American racing street party. Alan Bestwick with Bill Adam. Welcome to our coverage of the Race of a Thousand Years, named for the real Millennium Celebration, according to organizers. This is our highlight coverage of what is a six-hour race on a tight street circuit on a hot, steamy day. Bill, this is going to be a tough one. It will from a number of aspects. At this track particularly, with a number of blind corners, it puts a real challenge to the drivers because once fatigue sets in, you tend to get lazy. You don't look far enough ahead. And you come around that corner, somebody stopped sideways across the road and your race is over. But the other thing when fatigue sets in, you start going over curbs. And we've already seen every driver, every crew chief worry about this fatigue. They don't want suspension pieces to break. Their worries exaggerated this morning by this incident. This is the pole sitting Audi that's been bulletproof all year long. Dindo Capello on board into the outside barrier after suspension failure in this morning's practice. That has sent a shiver up and down every driver and team manager's spine this morning. Let's get more on where the pole sitting car stands. Here's Martin Haven on pit road. Folks, for nearly two months, Alan McNish has been the champion-elect in the prototype class of the American Le Mans series. Only the most bizarre of circumstances could have denied him the title. Two days ago, that's what we got. He injured his back, climbing out of a kilt, his Scottish national dress. His fitness was in question, and once that question mark had just been eradicated, this morning, as we've just so dramatically seen, the car pitched into the wall. Now, the Audi team aren't sure why. They haven't recovered all of the missing components of the car. Some of them are in a storefront downtown. But what they are sure of is that the rebuilt Audi number 77 will be good to go for this race. McNish will start. He has to do 25 laps to claim the title. That should be the end of the drama here. Hopefully things are a little quieter further down the grid. Maybe Calvin Fish can tell us. Well, yes, indeed, Martin. In the GTS category, Olivier Beretta will clinch his second consecutive driver championship. Now, it's been quite a ride for the young Frenchman. Over the past two seasons, he scored 13 victories in ALMS competition and two class wins at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. But at the end of today's race, this Orica team will shelve these Chrysler Vipers, as they're known here in, the, in Australia, and then begin their LMP program for the year 2001. But don't be too disappointed, because next year it still promises to be a battle of American muscle cars, as the very fast Chevy Corvettes take up on a new challenge from the Celine S7. Drivers, start your engines. 
The engines have fired. We're getting set to go with a race of a thousand years here on the street course in Adelaide. Let's take a look at what the drivers face over the next few hours. The Adelaide street circuit, without question, the finest in the world. 2.35 miles at 16 turns of work. Down the front straight, we're over 150 miles an hour, flat out before hard braking, and up ahead, the Senna chicane. Watch the curves, careful down through here. Look at this, third gear, just back and forth, fighting the car. A brief shot of full acceleration, up along this straight, 140 miles an hour again. Once again, fight the steering wheel, a heavy braking one more time, and all the way down to second gear. Second gear, full throttle for a moment before you're off it. Turn in here, full throttle again right now. Squeeze on that power. And again, you're back off. Still second gear. Fight the car around these corners. Now you get a little more run down this hill. Back up to third gear, full throttle one more time. Careful, tuck it in tight. Don't let the car catch those curves. They'll pull you in the walls. And up ahead, a critical corner. Now this one leads on to one of the long straights. We're full throttle now, 130 miles an hour coming up here, up to fifth gear. Stab on the brakes, drop a gear over the curbs right here, and now the longest straight in the track. This is the Brabham straight. The car will reach 175 miles an hour. Way, way up ahead. We're looking for braking markers. Get ready. Here we go. We're on the brakes as hard as we can. We're going all the way down to the gearbox. First gear, turn in tight, and try to put down the 700 horsepower. Grab your next gear around this long left-hand corner. Keep it set up tight and one more time. Feed right out to the wall. Now the long left-hander that'll approach down to the Victoria Park hairpin. Flat around here and one more time as deep as you can go into this corner. One more time, second gear all the way down to 40 miles an hour and it feeds back onto the front straight. This circuit at Adelaide is a lot of work. And has been very demanding on the cars mechanically. We've seen it practice. We've already seen it on broadcast. It's going to be an issue in this race of a thousand years. Three classes of cars compete together in the American Le Mans series. You're looking at the prototype cars, the purpose-built open top made for racing cars. The GTS cars like the Viper we saw earlier, production-based, and the GT cars, production-based, a little smaller engine displacement and a little bit slower. Field of 25 cars. Made the trip down here to Australia. As you look at the Cadillacs come through, there's the Raffinelli Lola, the Conrad Ford powered machine, and then the first of the Vipers, the GTS machines. Cars on their parade and pace laps now before we get the green flag and the start of the race of a thousand years. Let's take a look at the starting lineup. For our event today, on pole, the Audi R8, Alan McNish and Dindo Capello. Capello doing the driving honors, his fourth pole of the season. It's Frank Vila and Emanuele Piro in the second of the Audis on the outside of the front row. An all Aussie team, David Brabham and Greg Murphy and Jason Bright in the Pano's Roadster. Inside of row two, their team car, Johnny O'Connell and Hiroki Kato. Outside of the fourth spot, then the 2001 model, Pano's with Magnuson and Graf starting in fifth position. Two Cadillacs will start in sixth and seventh. Emmanuel Collard to start in that car. The number 32 car, his teammate Christophe Tinso, the Frenchman, to start there. Eighth position, it's the Raffinelli Lola, the Italian Mimo Scatarella to do the first stint behind the wheel. There's the Conrad Ford, Franz Conrad to start that machine. Rounding out the top 10, fastest qualifier of the GTS cars, Olivier Beretta looking to lock up his second straight GTS title. There's the GT pole sitter, Lucas Lohr to start with his teammate Dirk Muller to fall in behind and now the rest of the field in the race of a thousand years and that GT championship is going to be a fierce one. The 51 car is the team car to Lure and Muller and those four drivers between them are going to race for the championship. That plus the three BMWs right behind in 15th, 16th and 17th. Those cars from the five all the way down through the six machine in the grid extremely tight in qualifying and it is going to be a huge race for the victory in the GT class, I believe. It will. I think the GT class will be one of the best battles that we're going to hear from today. And they are so close, as Alan just pointed out, that it's remarkable. It's really going to come down to who makes the fewest mistakes and who can drive with the greatest precision, because we will, without question, get yellow flags. And you want to try and take every single advantage you can. So a lot of pressure on these drivers. Got some great onboard cameras to help us with our coverage of the race of a thousand years. This is Boris Said in one of the BMW M3s. 15th position. Just ahead of him in the grid is the 51 Dick Barber racing Porsche. Sasha Mawson behind the wheel of that car as he gets set to go from 14th position. Up to the prototypes, the Raffinelli Lola, Mimo Scatarella, the Italian on board, 8th position on the grid. 
Car a little skittish in practice. We'll see those hands do a lot of work it from was. that he, camera. He had to do a heck of a lot of work all through practice qualifying because it, it sprung so stiffly. And now we're on board the Pano as another one of the LNP cars, David Brabham. And this should be very exciting. He has got the added incentive of racing at home. And on pole, the car that was crashed this morning, repaired, put back together, but will run its first lap since then. We dropped the green flag. Alan McNish looking to lock up the American Le Mans Series championship by running 25 laps in this car. But again, he has no idea what's going to happen when the green flag flies. No, it's a tribute to the team. When you talk about a team like Yost Racing, who have run this car so successfully all season long, they have battled through the absolute worst down at Sebring. They came out with a, a marvelous victory down there. And four hours ago, they were sitting with this smoking wreck of this car hard up against the barrier. There it is on the track. But, you know, it is always in the back of your mind as a driver when you get back into a car that has just had a huge shunt. Did they fix everything properly? Having a team like Yost takes away a lot of the worries. You, you know that these fellows are professional by everyone's standards, and they are going to do the best job they can. See, the pit window is 45 to 65 minutes, 65 for the slower cars, 45 for the prototypes. So basically, McNish, if he runs to the first pit stop without problem, is going to win the series championship. Yes. But again, without problem, we thought they could run a half hour practice oh. session this morning without problem, and it wound up stuffed in the fence. So I'm sure he's got to be tense. Do we see the team car squirt out front and McNish lay back a little bit in the opening laps till he feels the thing out? You know what? I doubt it. I, I think knowing Allen and knowing the team, they will tell him to go as hard as he comfortably can. And again, Allen's own self drive will yeah. want to lead the race. If you're leading, it's the safest place that you can be. You, you can drive what's up ahead of you rather than having to maybe watch the back of a car. And if that car ahead of you makes a mistake, you might take you out too. So Allen's safest bet would be to jump into the lead to try and pull away just a little bit. The back of car also may play somewhat of a, a blocking position to try and keep David Brabham and the Panos from challenging Allen, take some of the pressure off. You see the lights out atop the pace car getting set to turn onto pit road. They're coming to the final corner before the start finish line. The race of a thousand years. The season finale for the American Le Mans series on the street circuit in Adelaide, Australia. A huge crowd estimated at better than 76,000 has turned out. It's been a spectacular event all week long. And now we're set to go racing and get the season finale underway. Here comes McNish and Bila down to the green flag, and we're green at Adelaide. We are indeed, and look at McNish. He jived over this to drop off the back of his teammate's car. So you were right that I think the teammate got a great jump. And watch Allen in that car that looks like a crocodile. Certainly looked like an orchestrated move there. It was indeed. Allen carefully just took a look in the mirror there to see where David Brabham was, and both these drivers are so good. At this point, it's not something you really worry about as a driver. If you've got somebody with immense ability that's around you, you can drive as fast as you can comfortably because you know that they're not going to make a stupid mistake that may take you out of the race. Safely through the first couple of quarters. Something so unusual for street circuits. You'll notice that the cars yeah. are relatively smooth here. This track is, is so good, so exceptional in every single area. I have never seen anything like it. Coming up now toward the long Brabham straightaway. Named for Sir Jack Brabham, Australian three-time Formula One world champion. And the win, once again, four lanes wide. Incredible safety here. Many, many opportunities for passing, lots of runoff areas. The design is really exceptional. They have taken something that has been used for city streets and really have transformed it into a wonderful, wonderful racing facility. Up now to the final quarter. This is the, the, the U-shaped hairpin leading on the front straight. They are down to about 42 miles an hour at that point. Very tight. Now they come blasting down this straight past us. Call it the Victoria Park hairpin. This part of the course resides inside Victoria Park. What is called the East Parkland section of the city of Adelaide. Now to the center chicane. And cleanly through lap number one. So Bila leads in the 78 Audi. Second is McNish in the 77 car. The crocodile painted machine, if you will. That's crocodile done Audi. Yeah. Looking ahead, this is David Brabham in third in the Pinos. And watch how hard David has to fight the wheel. I mean, he really battles with this car and gives it his all, whereas the Audis all season long, we've watched how good they are over bumps. Here's a perfect example. Terrific amount of work. It just, just stabs the gearbox down. Keep in mind the sequential gearbox. You just pull it back. There he is, he's changing up. Pull it back. The spring loading takes it back to a neutral position for downshifting, push it forward. 
Getting downshifted, head around that little hook onto the Brabham straight. Now, one of the cars will drop a gear, but he didn't. That's right. One of the advantages of the six liter motor. Now, look at our telemetry on board here. All 170 miles an hour. Heavy braking. Look at that deceleration. That is just as impressive as the acceleration. Giant brakes in these cars. They just grip and slow the car down so fast. If your mouth isn't closed, it just well, blows your tongue out. And around to the final corner to complete another lap. Now, the leaders haven't gotten to the slower traffic yet, but it is a concern for these drivers. Yeah. On a street circuit with the barriers in close to the racing surface, where you catch the traffic and what happens when you get there. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a serious problem on any circuit that we go to, but particularly on tracks like this where you have the walls and so many blind corners, and the series of corners are coming up to right here. They're sort of pointed staff. In the, in the big cars, they're in second gear all the way through this. You just briefly get under full throttle and then immediately back under hard braking. One more time and just brief little shots of gas. When they come on the slower cars, particularly the GT class cars, it could be a major problem for them. This is the view from behind McNish's head. See the jostling and the bouncing he takes. Now, this is a guy who didn't get out of bed yesterday. He yeah. spent all day yesterday flat on his back because of an aching back trying to get rested and well enough to run the 25 laps he needs to here today to win the championship. And it makes an interesting comparison, too, when you watch David Brabham inside the Panos, and he is getting violently thrown around back and forth. So McNish running second behind his teammate Frank Bila in the opening laps of the race of a 1,000 years at Adelaide for the American Le Mans Series. There's our leaderboard. We'll come back in a moment. You're watching the American Le Mans Series on NBC. No matter where we go in life, we each take a part of our family with us. Their nurturing and caring, their unique way of seeing the world. Our families give us the courage to be curious and the heart to have hope. They teach us how important it is to laugh and what it's like to be loved every single day. Here's to the places where inspiration is born, to families big and small, with thanks for making our family such a welcome part of yours. Olive Garden, when you're here, your family. How can you keep track of the latest in sports car racing? Monthly, with Le Mans and Sports Car Racer magazine. New from the publishers of F1 Racing and Autosport. Call 1-800-800-3921 to subscribe. It's the fastest way to keep track. Insightful columns, exclusive interviews, dazzling photography. Every month from Le Mans and Sports Car Racer magazine. New from the publishers of F1 Racing and Autosport. Call 1-800-800-3921 to subscribe. It's the fastest way to keep track. This American Le Mans series is brought to you by the Olive Garden. When you're here, your family. And by Audi. It's the race of a thousand years. Season finale for the American Le Mans series. Highlight coverage on NBC Sports from Adelaide, Australia. Look at the beautiful setting. Unbelievable. Of course. While watching the lead two cars, as they have been for most of the second half of the season, the Audi R8s, Frank Bila in the 78 car, the silver with red spoilers there leading, and the crocodile painted Audi with Alan McNish aboard running in second spot. They have opened up pretty significant lead on the Pano's cars. David Brabham and Johnny O'Connell running in third and fourth, but now seven and eight seconds behind these two lead Audis, respectively. It really is impressive right now. I'm looking at the lap times that they're turning with a full fuel load under race conditions, and they're lapping faster than every other car has lapped in qualifying, with the exception of two of the Pano's. So they're, they're just running a blistering pace right now. There's Brabham running in third. The all Aussie effort. Fielded by the Pano's team here this weekend. Now this is the 2000 
Pato's car. Also in the race today, a 2001 new model Pato's, and Calvin Fish has more on that for us. Whilst many of the teams will spend the winter break getting their brand new cars ready for the upcoming season, Panos Motorsports got a jump start on the year 2001 by debuting their brand new design here in Adelaide. Now it's called named the LMP07 and it's very distinctive in its design. At the heart of the design is a brand new engine package. Gone is the 6 litre V8 and in its place a brand new 4 litre V8 built by Zytec. Much lighter in weight, 60 kilograms lighter. What that has allowed the designers to do is to really clean up the aerodynamics over the front end of the car. When we get to the center of the car in the cockpit area, you'll notice that the fuel cell is now located between the driver and the engine. Much safer and also better for weight distribution. Now on the sides here we see these very distinctive dorsal fins. They add great head impact protection for the driver and also increase the chassis rigidity, improving the handling. Now one disadvantage with a front engine design is the fact that the driver sits very far back in the chassis and that disrupts the airflow to the rear wing. So the designers once again have paid careful attention to the aerodynamics, sculpted out the bodywork, improving the airflow to the rear wing. Now Panos Motorsports are hoping that these changes in this new car design will enable them to challenge those all-conquering Audis, not only here at Adelaide, but also in the year 2001. Good looking race car, unfortunately it's not good running today. Moments ago, the 2001 car on pit road with Jan Magnussen aboard. Well, it's one of the necessary evils of developing a new car that you have to expect a lot more problems. And it's good to get the car out at this point to try and run as hard as they can and to try and break it. Find out where the weaknesses are and build that bulletproof race car just like what Audi have done. Unfortunately, you see the car being wheeled back into the garage. Calvin Fish can give us more on what's wrong with that 2001 machine. Calvin? Well, Alan, after only a few laps, Jan Magnussen reported on the radio that the car had a misfire. They immediately brought the car in, wheeled it into the garage area. Right now, they're taking a look inside the engine. They believe it may be an electrical problem. They've kept the driver in the car. They're trying to get some very valuable uh, testing time out on the racetrack because it's very hot here in Australia. They can't duplicate these type of testing conditions in Europe or in the United States at the moment. So they're unsure if the car will be back on track, but they're desperately working on the car. Hopefully, we'll see it back in action. This car's not had a lot of time on the racetrack no. like a new car normally would. They kind of rushed it here because if you're going to run 12 hours at Sebring in March and you're going to run 24 hours at Le Mans in June, why not get a six-hour test on it here in Adelaide? Well, it's perfect, too. I mean, you, you really want to try and stress the car as early as you can and, and try and develop it. There is no such thing as a perfect race car. These are only really developed after hours and countless hundreds of hours of testing and, and you keep building it up to make the lightest strong part you don't want to build something that's far too heavy but but it's very difficult to build something light at a minimum weight with the strength that you need you never know what the g-forces or, or various uh, forces are going to be subjecting this car to looking at david brabham running in third this is the 2000 model panos the lmp1 big six liter engine mean looking race car oh it's a great car boy it is back straight here and it just takes your ears out. Brabham running 10.5 seconds behind Frank Bieler in the lead Audi so with just 12 laps of the race completed out of what will be pretty close to 600 laps that yeah. they'll run that's a pretty demoralizing hole to get put into this early. It is, and it, it's quite remarkable. This Audi team have come off the blocks this year and have been so strong. But one of their strengths has been suspension. All season long, we've seen them go over bumps with a definite, a visible superiority to any of the race car. They're able to absorb the bump and uh, not get upset by the bumps. Here, if the Audi drivers have to go over curbs to, to avoid a car, to get an electrode off a corner, it doesn't seem to trouble them very much, whereas watching David work in the Panos, that's a lot of work in that car. And Mimo Scatterella, even more so in the Lola. Watching Lucas Lohr in one of the Dick Barber racing Porsches. This is the GT class leader. Remember, we described earlier the three different types of cars all competing together. This is the slowest of the three classes here. Don't mistake that no. for being slow. Watch this as he just hauls around this very tight Adelaide street circuit. Yeah, they, these cars are a lot of fun on this track. They're not overpowered. They just they kind of point and squirt between the corners. And something for our viewers that are wondering, what's that thing hanging off the dashboard? It's just an airline, something the drivers can adjust and point air wherever they want. So it, it looks rather dangerous, but it's not. It's a soft rubber tube strictly for driver comfort. Now look at the championship standings in this, the final race of the season for the American Le Mans Series. One point between first and second, seven points between first and third. Now the top two drivers, they co-drive the same car.
The second two drivers, Muller and Lure, they co-drive this car, the five. Theoretically, there could be a tie, a three-way tie, mm -hmm. for the championship in this class at the end of the race. If, the way that the points work, if Muller and Lure in this five car win the race, and Mossad and Wallach don't, then, without getting too complicated, there are bonus points for who drives the fastest lap in the race. The championship for the season's worth of racing could be decided by who of these four drivers runs the fastest lap of this class during the race. And should we say anything about we're glad that this race isn't in Florida because a recount will be requested? Oh, uh, and we leave you in charge of that. You're from Miami. I see a bit of Chad hanging down right there, so. <laughs> You saw the fastest laps run so far among those four drivers. So right a now, good, good battle, too. Yeah. And look at the BMW creeping in right behind. Yes. That is Bill Oberlin in one of the prototype technology group BMW M3s. And we expect them to give these two Porsches a fit for the class victory during the season. Race lead, the two Audi R8s. And again, Alan McNeish, he keeps closing up on the back of his teammate's car, and although he he hasn't made any attempt to pass. At one point, I did see him pull out. He just, just dropped out a line to let them know that, hey, I am back here. If there's an opportunity, I really do think you should let me pass. Looks like he wants to get around, but remember, McNish with the sore back, the car that was crashed in the warm-up this morning, and this being a six-hour race that we're just into, there's really no reason to press it that hard. His first goal has to be to keep this car between the walls and in one piece till he runs 25 laps. Yes. At the point that he's run 25 laps and he's the champion, now he can race for the win. No, but what, what Alan may want to do is to, to reach a comfort level for him that is a faster pace than what is currently being run. By running at a pace that he's not comfortable at, sometimes drivers feel their concentration slipping a little bit. Here's our telemetry on board once again. Look at the speedometer climb. 140, 150, 160 down the street. Just terrific acceleration and watch the braking. Don't you wish your streetcar would do that? No, because I'd get in trouble. Oh, boy. <laughs> what, a, what a great... I, I've felt all season long these Audis are such beautiful race cars. They would make terrific look at streetcars. So the top two, pretty much as expected, are the Audi R8s, but we've seen enough drama here this weekend with cars not finding the curbings and the walls of this Adelaide Street Course friendly, that it is far from over. There's the leaderboard in the race of a thousand years. The Pay Nose Racing School at Road Atlanta and Sebring International Raceway. 1-888-282-GTRA. Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, David Duvall, and more in a test to see who's best. The exciting conclusion of the EMC Golf Skills Challenge next. NBC as we bring you the 56th annual Toyota Gator Bowl. Watch as the leading underclassman of the Heisman voting quarterback Michael Vick leads the Virginia Tech Hokies as they battle the aggressive defense of the Clemson Tigers. Virginia Tech Clemson in the Toyota Gator Bowl tomorrow 1230 Eastern on NBC. It's the race of a thousand years from Adelaide in the state of South Australia. Alan McNish has taken over the race lead and has clinched the American Le Mans Series Championship for 2000. We'll take those one at a time. First, when he took the lead away from his teammate, Frank Bila, just a little while ago. It was back um, about lap number three, uh, lap number six. Uh, check that, lap 25. I'll get that right. <laughs> As McNish made the move in traffic on his teammate, Bila. Yeah, I think this is Allen's version of the crocodile ball because he wanted to set up Bila and just 
takes a really nice outside pass here, gets on the throttle early. Watch the foot box, look at this. Just a beautiful pass, he set that up so perfectly. Really got great momentum off the corner, and now he is back in his own game. He's running a really hard pace, but obviously very comfortable. Should I try for three? It was lap 17 when he took the lead. Why not? Then at lap 25, McNish crossed the start-finish line and under the American Le Mans Series point system locked up the championship. He ran enough laps in the race today to be eligible for points. And with the lead he had, no matter where he finished, once he became eligible for points, the championship was his. So congratulations to Allen, a truly impressive season. He has been so impressive. The more I watch Allen over these, these American Le Mans races, the more impressed I am with him all the time. He just constantly looks like perfection in every sense. He's so good picking up apexes, so precise, and his passing is always done with the utmost safety. I mean, he's just, he really is a superb driver, and I think this is one of the reasons that he got the Formula One testing contract from Toyota. Five wins in the 11 races we've run so far. He's finished first or second with his teammate, Dindo Capello, in the last seven straight races, amazing. first or second. Just amazing. And McNish really has um, revived his career the last few years. He was kind of on the outs after being an aspiring Formula One driver and things went, went sour on him. He was kind of shoved aside and this ride with Audi, plus some work he did with Porsche before that, has really revived his career and made him a superstar in auto racing. Well, a, a lot of driving cars, whether it's uh, an ALMS car, a Formula One car, involves your own self-confidence. Alan, unfortunately, had a, a horrendous accident a few years ago in England where someone was also killed, and I think that was a hard part in his career for him. It, it really took him some time to readjust and, and to reacquire that confidence. It's so important, but nowadays, the way he drives, it, and I think it shows in his body English, when we are on board the car and you look behind him, you look at the movement of his helmet, it's just a very soft motion to the side when he checks his mirrors, and that shows that he's driving very comfortably. McNish is up 14.7 seconds on his teammate Frank Bila. The Audi's holding the top two spots. David Brabham in third is a half minute behind in the Pinos LMP1. You know, it's, a, it's really a shame that our, our cameras don't do justice to the paint job on this Audi because it is incredibly good. I think a, a tribute again to South Australia. It's supposed to be a crocodile. Up it close, is. it is a very good crocodile, but like, like most paint jobs that companies do, they look great when you're standing up close, when you yeah. put them on a television camera at a race car coming by at 100 some miles an hour, it kind of loses something. It's true. Here's the other champion crowned so far today, Olivier Beretta, second straight GTS class championship in the American Le Mans series. As he drives the, what is in Australia, Chrysler Viper. We know it in America as the Dodge Viper. Good. David Man. Brabham on pit road. Third place car. Under Le Mans series rules, if you're not familiar with it, the car cannot be worked on while it's being fueled. The engine has to be switched off, and you see the tire changers getting their equipment in position, but they can't touch the car until the fueling rig is pulled out and removed. Yeah, careful there, fellas. Just, just watch this, and as soon as those probes are pulled out, you can watch these things going and just spin those huge lug nuts off. Now, this is here. There we go. Carefully orchestrated by the crew chief, there will be somebody there signaling these fellas, and they will tell them through their own radio system when to go to save every single second that they can. Only two air inches and, allowed. And that right there, he's measuring tire and brake temperatures with that. That's a thermal readout that he doesn't physically have to touch anything with it, but he gets good readout to know how the car is doing. Third place car, it's back onto the racetrack. David Bratton, another one of these drivers, and it's, he's so impressive. You meet him and he's so quiet and soft-spoken and always has a smile. Put him into a race car and the intensity just comes right to the top immediately. Very, very good in the car. A lot of fun to watch. A lot of folks say that this championship for Alan McNish is his revenge on yes. David Brabham. That's because a good point. it was Brabham who beat McNish for a 1989 British Formula 3 championship, something that Alan was apparently a little sour about losing out on. And I would bet that there's going to be a little dig at the end of this race to go over and say, do you remember? <laughs> well, this is payback. So Brabham back on course. You see, oh, one of the BMWs is stopped. That is the... Yeah, I couldn't tell what the number was. That was a head-on view, but we'll try and get that for you as quickly as possible. I believe that is the Boris Sed car that is off the side of the road. The white banner should be the number seven machine, so Boris yep. Sed in some trouble here. That is it. There it is, number seven. Now, no physical damage, so that's set some sort of mechanical failure. Each of the three BMWs this weekend, the Tom Milner cars, have suffered problems, in, which is really unusual because, again, the circuit is so smooth that it seems to have put 
very little strain on the cars, but one car went through an axle, one had a motor problem, and, and the third one uh, was never reported to us. But Boris had entered this race to try and run a nice reduced pace and then perhaps pick it up near the end of the race. So uh, this is very unexpected. Martin, what's up with Boris Set's car? Hatchdog says, Boris said on the radio simply, the engine's running, but the wheels aren't turning. They've got no drive now. A uh, broken drive shaft on the final lap of practice for Bill Orville in, in the number 10 car. But as you said, Boris's plan was to keep it off the curbs, out of trouble, and attack in the final hour. Looks like that plan, like so many this weekend, has already gone west. Wow. Tough break there for Boris. David Brabham back on track in fourth position after the pit stop. He'll move back up to third when his teammate Johnny O'Connell comes in for his fuel and tire stop. And should begin to see the lead two cars, the Audis, come on pit road any moment, too. Now, will Alan McNish get out of his car when he makes the pit stop? He has had the sore back, remember, was flat on his back yesterday, went to a hospital Friday night for x-rays to make sure he hadn't broken something, injured his back. And this is a story he'll get teased about for a long time, stepping out of a kilt. Allen is a Scotsman. We told you this at the top of the show as O'Connell comes in. This was the third place car. Uh, McNish was in a kilt for a publicity photo. And when he stepped out of it, his back popped. Now, there's also a rumor that, of course, he is Scottish and he spied a penny sitting on the ground and bent over very quickly to pick it up. But we know that wasn't true. Mr. Adam, a Scotsman, makes yes. that assessment. That's great. Checking under the back end of the O'Connell car. Again, measuring those tire and brake temperatures. I've been very pleased for Johnny O'Connell this weekend. He has driven very quickly, very smoothly. There's the other Audi in the pit also at the same time. Frank Bela, second place car is in. Calvin? Yes, Frank Bela pulls the 78 car, and we expect McNish, the leader in here shortly. Meanwhile, one of the painos does a burnout. That's Johnny O'Connell right behind the 78 machine. There'll be no driver change here, and we anticipate that there'll be no tire change here as well for the 78 car. Meanwhile, they're clearing it us out of the 77 pit. We expect McNish in at any time. Johnny O'Connell did not take tires, no. so he'll double stint on the Painos. They've got some tires out on the Vila car, but he is going to fire it up and leave without changing any either. This is really a slow stop for the Audi team. I'm quite surprised at that. And you can see O'Connell took great advantage. He now has moved up a position. I think Johnny O'Connell will be ahead of the Audi on the track. Pit entry will be on the right here as we ride with leader Alan McNish. There he is. He's he coming in. So after 37 laps and about uh, 50 minutes of this race, Alan McNish, the new American Le Mans Series champion for 2000, comes in to make his pit stop. Let's see if he'll get out of the car to save that ailing back or if he'll stay in and do a double stint. Now nah, he's going to stay. You know, one thing in his favor, remember, these cars are uh, paddle shift race cars. They have the shifters behind the steering wheel, so once Allen gets underway, he really doesn't have to use his left foot for any clutch action. He can brace himself, and of course, his seatbelt straps will hold him firmly in place, so he is fairly comfortable. Calvin Fish. Well, the strategy was for Allen to do one stint only, but as we could see, he got up to speed very quickly, feels very comfortable in the race car. Reinhold Joost came over to me just a few minutes before he came in and said, we expect Allen to stay in the car. The refueling has been completed. They clean out the front grill. Allen McNish continues on his way in an attempt to capture his sixth victory of the season. No tires and back on track. For oh. Whoa, close call. That was O'Connell coming through. Wow. So O'Connell's pit stop faster than McNish's. Or was that just to unlap himself? That was just to unlap himself. Okay. So it was faster than McNish's. He got through. You know, this is interesting. No, watch the two cars by comparison to see the Panos and the Audi. The Audi has left the pits with hot tires. We're going to have excellent situations with both these cars running about as equal as can be. And let's see how they compare when they get down to the straight here. Probably be no comparison. Well, I don't know. Remember that the Panos got a 6-liter V8 Ford motor. The Audi is a 3.6-liter twin turbo so you can't get much more difference in these two cars when they get on the long straight the pano should get a jump right off the line but boy that audi is so quick at the top end of the straight just before the braking zone very fast yeah so alan mcnish after the first set of pit stops here we go clinched the championship he holds the race lead and he's trying to put a lap again on the fourth place car johnny o'connell it's mcnish and bila in the audis in the top two followed by brabham o'connell in the Pano's machines, and then Mimo Scatterella in the Raffinelli Lola, rounding out your top five. Wanted to take a moment here and remember a friend and colleague. Steve Evans was a member of our NBC Le Mans broadcast team until passing away unexpectedly several weeks ago. Steve shared his passion and enthusiasm for all forms of motorsports with millions of viewers over many years, and we're grateful for the energy and fun he brought to our time together.
BMWs and the Porsches staging a classic battle. It went on for hours. Finally, the BMW of Hans Stuck and Boris Set took the checkered flag. The celebration didn't last. You don't lift off the gas. You don't push in the clutch. Electronically, the engine is interrupted for a nanosecond to make that shift happen. And this is the kind of technology, I'm proud to say, that comes out of racing that someday maybe we'll all enjoy, huh? I'm holding a year's salary, by the way. You know, why do you think hot rodders always hang out at hamburger joints? Fast food and fast cars. Whoa, ho, ho, just go together. At Michelin, we know there's only one safety feature on the road that actually touches the road. That's why we're introducing the Michelin Cross-Terrain SUV tire. Because we designed it specifically for SUVs, you get a level of handling and responsiveness you never thought possible in an SUV. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. What would happen if an SUV were raised by a family of sports cars? Zoom, zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah, zoom, 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 zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zoom, zoom, Introducing the 200 horsepower Mazda Tribute. The SUV with the soul of a sports car. Coming to NBC in 2001. It's the race of a thousand years from Adelaide, South Australia, for the American Le Mans Series season finale for 2000. You're watching highlight coverage here on NBC. What is a six hour race? And we're now just at the one hour mark. It has been quite an eventful opening hour for the event. There's the leader. It is now Dindo Capello on board, having just relieved co driver Alan McNish a little while ago. Yeah, we're seeing different levels of, of driving here. We're seeing uh, Alan and, and Dindo both put up just tremendous performances. They are driving for the team that everybody would like to drive for a team that literally approaches perfection and they deserve to be there because their own driving comes as close as you could ask for now there are a lot of other drivers in this race that have driven with less perfection shall i say to be polite mcnish started the race remember bad back putting that in question this is moments ago he came down pit road to get out after a double stint Somewhat surprising with the sore back coming into the day. Very much so, a real Iron Man performance. He just saw him, him unhook the radio. That's the little radio hookup that he put on the Velcro on the top of his helmet. Then he gets out of the way. He doesn't risk even staying in the car to try and help his co-driver buckle up. Don't hurt the back, Alan. That's number one. Capello is up on the team car, the 78 Audi, now being driven by Emanuele Piero by 1 minute 13.2 seconds. A pretty big amount on a traffic here, on a track here where the qualifying was about a minute 23 and change. So he's got almost a lap advantage over second place. Does Capello you're looking at there. Now, I mentioned it's been quite an eventful opening hour of this event. Let's go back and look at some of the things that have happened here in the last few moments, starting with the team car, the 78 Audi. Frank Beeler was on board a moment ago, and the 51 car was being driven by Bob Wallach. That's the Porsche. Look at this. Wallach just chops down going into a corner. They make contact just barely touching the nose of the Audi, but what Wallach didn't realize, one of those wing plates on the front end of the Audi cut Wallach's tire. He had to come into the pits because of that. Then suddenly, the 78 car came to a stop for a moment. Maybe an ignition failure, maybe even something as simple as knocking the key off. You're looking at the pit stop here for Wallach and the damage to the right rear. Was not significant damage. The rubber bouncing around did rip the shock reservoir loose. Now, this was Didier Derodigas trying to make a pass on Johnny O'Connell. He missed. Yeah, Didier had worked really hard to try and get by O'Connell, went in very deep. And this one here now. Brian this, Cunningham. Just an amazing display. I think he watched too many Olympics and was watching springboard competitions, decided to try it, and you don't get high marks for that one. He was the GT class leader, broke a half shaft with that bounce over the curb, limped it back around to the pits where it spent time in the garage getting repairs. 
Next up for problems was Johnny O'Connell in the paint hose. We saw he got away clean when Doronagas tried to move underneath him. This is stag corner. Look at this. And apparently, the worst possible combination, very bad brakes and the throttle sticking wide open. Oh, my Lord, how to get a heart attack. Fortunately for him, the escape road was there, one of the safety design features of this course here in Adelaide. He got the car back around to the garage. They put it behind the wall where they spent some time getting repairs made. So eventful, the word for hour one of this race of a thousand years. Yeah, and, and I think one of the, the truly remarkable things is the 77 car continues to circulate at this blistering pace. They still are running times only two seconds off their qualifying. When the qualifying is done with no other traffic on the track, low fuel load, now they have to combat all of the other cars out here, and they have this blistering pace, lap after lap after lap. It, it just really takes all the heart out of the competition for anybody else. While you watch Capello circulate, let's update a couple of other stories. One of the Cadillacs, the 32 car with Mark Goose aboard went behind the wall back earlier in the race uh, about a half an hour ago with uh, engine problems looks like they're done for the day and uh, we've got as far as uh, this is uh, Hiroki Kato in that paint hose remember we saw O'Connell with the stuck throttle and brake problem they went to the garage got it repaired then Kato came out stopped on course Martin what's happened is back. well Bill you said it right open throttle and both feet on the brake to try and slow the car down was Johnny O'Connell's problem and Warren Rocky Cato came off the start finish line the last time he had no gears in the car and he's got no drive and if you can imagine if your road car engine is racing full ahead and you're standing on the brakes the kind of strain it puts on the transmission well give that another three or four hundred horsepower and you can imagine exactly what the panels had to try and put up with <laughs> <laughs> That's not one of the fun incidents. You can see Cato was very anxious to get out of the car, and the crew seemed to be telling him to stay. I don't think he wanted to. See Cato stopping just past the pit exit, and the car getting brought back around by him into, well, by the course workers, yes. rather, into the pit area. Brave course workers there. They are indeed. They're, they're quite remarkable down here. There is Cato. His helmet is still on, but I don't know that he's going to be getting back on the car. And They're working on the rear end can't tell what they're doing. Couple of quick updates. The uh, leaderboard, Capello Piro, Greg Murphy on board the uh, David Brabham started Pano's. Then Norman Simon is on board the Raffinelli machine. Fifth place cars, the GTS leader, Carl Benlinger in the car that Olivier Beretta started, the Chrysler Viper GT. Dirk Muller leads in that class. He is eighth overall. Bob Wallach trying to dig out of the hole from the spin to ensure either he or teammate Sasha Mawson have a shot at the GT class championship. We are in Adelaide in the state of South Australia. We sent uh, one of our reporters out for a little tour around the area. We selected Martin Haven because he's from England and he knows which side of the road to drive on. you think of France. You think of France, you think of fine wine. And the same is true here outside Adelaide, just an hour away from the capital of South Australia is the heart of the Australian wine industry. We're in the fabulous Barossa Valley, where over 150 years ago, a Bavarian immigrant named Johann Gramp set in motion Australia's wine industry. And it was here at Jacobs Creek that the whole thing started. Aussies love the great outdoors. 90% of the population lives within an hour of the coast and the beach is part of the national culture. You may be waist deep in snow back home, but down under it's high summer and temperatures are in the 90s. As they say here in paradise, life's a beach. What could be better after a long hot day sweating in the sun on the beach than a cold beer. And here in Eastern Adelaide, the family brewery firm of Coopers has been producing some of Australia's top beers since 1881. They were in business much the same time the wine industry was founded. And from this tiny little brewery in the heart of the city, they produce some of the world's finest beers, available here in South Australia and in homebrew form across the world. That's enough from me, yeah, from Coopers, cheers. Now, you notice when Martin had that wine glass in his hand, how yes. much he looks like Dr. Evil? Yes, he does. From the movie? <laughs> and, and I also noticed that he gets all the assignments involving good drinking. 
Dindo Capello is leading in the Audi R8, the race of a thousand years from Adelaide, South Australia. You're watching the American Le Mans series on NBC. You never met my big Italian family, but they love you already. So tonight, they'll share with you a fresh salad this big. Then pass around the baby pictures. They'll share baskets of soft garlic breadsticks. Then pass around the baby. What they have, you can have. And that's how the Olive Garden feels. They call it Hospitaliano, which means everything of ours is yours. That's my cousin. She wants to share your dessert. The Olive Garden, when you're here, your family. How can you keep track of the latest in sports car racing? Monthly, with Le Mans and Sports Car Racer magazine. New from the publishers of F1 Racing and Autosport. Call 1-800-800-3921 to subscribe. It's the fastest way to keep track. You want to race? Or just drive like you've never driven before? We've got the cars. We've got the tracks. We've got one cool school. The Pay Nose Racing School at Road Atlanta and Sebring International Raceway. Call us at 1-800-849-RACE. This is one cool school. Insightful columns, exclusive interviews, dazzling photography. Every month on Le Mans and Sports Car Racer magazine. New from the publishers of F1 Racing and Autosport. Call 1-800-800-3921 to subscribe. It's the fastest way to keep track. College football's most electrifying player, Michael Vick, leads number five Virginia Tech versus Clemson in the Toyota Gator Bowl. New Year's Day at 12.30 Eastern on NBC. Coming up next on NBC, it's the EMC Skills Challenge. Among the competitors you'll see in action today, golfing legends Jack Nicklaus and Arnold Palmer, plus David Duvall and Nick Price, who hold out from 172 yards away in yesterday's mid-iron competition. It's the conclusion of the EMC Skills Challenge next on NBC. The American Le Mans Series race of a thousand years from Adelaide, South Australia. That is Dindo Capello leading in the Audi R8 up on his team car, Emanuele Piro, by a minute 11 seconds as we are at about a, an hour and 40 minutes in to this six hour race in our highlight coverage. The real fight in this one is going to be in the GT class. The championship in the prototype and GTS class is already having been locked up, but GT looking like it's going to come down to maybe the last lap of the season at the end of this race. Yeah, and it's getting better all the time. I mean, we've had a number of really good challenges today from BMWs, all of which have suffered problems. Now, it's coming down to between the two Dick Barber Porsches, and this could be a terrific political fight. Dirk Mueller is leading right now by one point. He has set the fastest race lap, but quite frankly, is not one of Porsche's favorite drivers at this point. He will be going to rival BMW next year, and I would be willing to bet a lot of money that somebody way high up at Porsche is going to call Mr. Wallach and say, put your foot in it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mueller it was the class leader till making this pit stop. Let's go to Martin Haven. Dick Barber Racing already tied up the team's championship two races ago. It's just down to the drivers to sort it out between themselves. Dick Barber made very sure that they knew exactly what the score was. He told all the members of the team that if any of his cars made contact with the other cars in the team, they would be called into the pits, put up on the air jacks, and left there. Now, he didn't go directly to the drivers to tell them to behave themselves. He just made sure that the team knew and the word would get through. Sasha Monson and Bob Wallach in the 51 Dick Barber car were leading the points coming in. This is Lucas Moore now back on board. Remember that the 51 car tangled with the 78 Audi earlier, lost positions. It has come back to second in class behind this machine, aided by problems for all three of the BMW GT machines. They've gone out with two broken half shafts and an overheating engine. We'll see some drivers from one of the support series for the American Le Mans series in this GT class next year. It is the Star Mazda series that I speak of. Star Mazda series, a premier proving ground for future road racing stars. Very tight competition with rotary power, offering an affordable stepping stone for young professional talent to showcase their abilities. Great little race cars. Next season, 99 Star Mazda champ Joey Hand will drive select races with the BMW PTG team for Tom Milder. 
In the American Le Mans Series GT category, 2000 champion Bernardo Martinez also scheduled a test with the PDG team in hopes of joining hand. In 2001, all the televised Star Mazda races will be in conjunction with the American Le Mans Series. It is a great spec series, a lot of fun to watch, and we look forward to getting our eyes on more of the Star Mazda competition next year. It really is a great training gun because what it does is teach you to drive and get the ultimate out of your car. Since you've basically got the same horsepower as all your competitors, the only way you're going to win is by driving smoother and just, just being fine in those critical areas, much like Alan McNish has been today. On board with Lucas Lohr in the Dick Barber Racing Porsche. This area down through here, these S's right here, the Senna S's, it is so much like Le Mans, it's just incredible. The trees at the side of the road, and then as you go up through this section of town, you're actually heading into the downtown core. Look up, look at the left there. Now, there's a hotel. There's a balcony up top, which a lot of the uh, the hotels down here all have, because apparently it used to be that a, a hotel could not sell beer or liquor unless it actually had rooms. So all of the taverns have balconies out there. I didn't know that. How about that? Very interesting. You've been doing your research. Yes, I have. Second place in GT, that's Bob Wallach, the veteran from France, chasing his team car there with Lucas Lohr, the German on board. There's the lead car. It's. Dindo Capello out in front by a minute nine seconds over his team car, the Audi Emanuele Piro, behind in the number two spot. We'll be back with more of the Race of a Thousand Years from Adelaide, Australia, after these words from our local NBC stations. This Monday. You investigate, what did you call it? Miraculous. Miraculous. Phenomena. Discover the difference between a mystery and a miracle. And this cloth is healing people. Mysterious Ways returns this Monday with all new episodes. We've stumbled across something that's going to save millions of lives. All new Mysterious Ways, NBC Monday, New Year's Day, 8, 7 central. Season-ending race for the American Le Mans Series, the race of a thousand years in Adelaide, South Australia. Beautiful course through the city streets as well as the East Parklands area. Race that has been dominated so far by the car that started on pole, the Audi R877 machine. Alan McNish locking up the championship by driving the first 25 laps of the race. Now Dindo Capello behind the wheel, and he has a minute eight second lead on their team car who runs in second place. And there's a dramatic difference here in the two driving styles. We've been able to watch Capello over the last few laps, where McNeish was very precise and pointing the car into the apexes without using very much curve. Capello is bouncing the car over. I mean, it, it's like a Baja buggy the way he's driving this thing. And I wonder if the people down at Audi who are getting the same picture as we are can't watch that and say, you might want to be just a little more careful on these laps, didn't they? Watching the GTS class leader, 91 machine, Dominique Dupuy, just ahead of the team car, Niamarim behind the wheel. Now they are separated by a lap, so even though they're nose to tail, they're actually a lap apart on the racetrack. 91 car started by Olivier Beretta, who locked up the GTS class championship. Whoops. Look at the smoke yeah. off that. Speaking of locking up, now oh, they're right there. Over the curbs. Went in way too deep, got, got wild, and that's the kind of thing that hurts the cars. That's what the BMWs have gone through all the time. The other car locking up the brakes, getting in there deep. Calvin Fish is down in the Viper pit. Calvin? Well, some of the drivers have really been complaining about the heat today, Alan, with the front engine car and that V10, it just generates massive heat and the cockpit's about 150 degrees cockpit temperature here today, they expect. And uh, both uh, Belloc and Vendling were very hot when they got out of the car. They had to get the cold towels going. Not the heat that we saw in Texas earlier this year. When you're on a street circuit, there's nowhere for the heat to go, and it just seems to really burn these guys up. It's almost like sitting in a sauna behind that V10 out there today. And if you notice on the front of the driver, the grill openings there, the teams have been paying a lot of attention to that when they've come down pit road too, because there's not a lot of cooling space mm -hmm. in the front of these cars. When you start to get some of the, the rubber marbles off the tires build up as a race wears on like this on a street course, overheating is a concern for these yeah, drivers. Quite honestly, I'm really quite surprised because this, this has not been a particularly hot day and we've had a good breeze blowing across the track. The air is very dry. There's very low humidity down here in South Australia. Now let's check into the fourth place running car overall. Norman Simon behind the wheel of the Isle of Garden, Raffinelli Lola. He has had an adventurous time in this race in the last 30 minutes or so. We're two hours, 45 minutes in now, about 18 minutes or so ago. Coming into Stag Corner, which is turn nine on the racetrack. 
Simon's four-wheeled car wound up being three-wheel drive. Let's take a look at what happened. One of these things is he approaches the corner. Oh, now he rests here. Look at that left front corner, and suddenly you see the nut go spinning off into the distance, and he is passed by his own wheel. Not the most comforting thing for the driver. <laughs> That's the same kind of an incident that happened this morning to the leading car with Dindo Capello when he broke the, uh, well, the, the left front wheel came yes. off and he stuffed it into the barrier's heart. Yeah. So Simon very lucky to get away with that and hang on to the fourth spot. Now, we're going to ride on board with he and a couple of other drivers. Bill, you mentioned at the top of our show and again just a little while ago as he ah, gets lapped the by the leader. The crocodile. How the, the curves on this street course are being abused by the drivers and how that's taking a toll on the cars. It really does. And, and again, the Audi all season long, we've seen a real superiority with its ability to absorb bumps. The springing and shock absorbers that they're using on this car, the setup is terrific. Through the corner, now we're onto the front straight. And you can be able to watch the steering wheels. We're going down the front straight. We'll be heading into the Santa S's where most of the cars have been having the problems with these curbs. Watch as Simon goes through. Let's see if he avoids the curbs and look at the steering wheel. Well, nothing there. That was beautifully done. In fact, this young driver who's fairly new to the Raffinelli team has really looked good in the car. We've seen two of the BMW GT cars break half shafts going over the curbs. Yeah, that's right. We saw one of the Porsche GT cars lose the left front suspension yesterday. They theorize by beating up the car over the curbs. You saw Simon hit the curb on exit there, jousting the car up in the air and back yeah. down. Yeah, and as the day goes on, I think something else that's going to add to this and make it even tougher for the drivers, as the light goes down, they become more and more fatigued. And then the problem of all these walls on the street circuit, your headlights can't see around the corner to pick up the apex as you want, so you tend to get a little more sloppy, and you bounce off curbs even more. The lead car just having put a lap on Norman Simon in the Raffinelli Lola. It's Dindo Capello out front by a minute five now. Two hours, 45 minutes in to the six hour race of a thousand years. The Pay Nose Racing School at Road Atlanta and Sebring International Raceway. 1 888 282 GTRA. Brian Boitano, Christy Yamaguchi, and Dorothy Hamill star in a special for the entire family. Imatrex presents the Brian Boitano Skating Spectacular New Year's Day. The XFL, real football, where everything is pushed to the extreme. Coming this February to NBC. The race of a thousand years for the American Le Mans series. Highlight coverage here on NBC from Adelaide, South Australia. The race being led by the Audi R8, number 77 car of Dindo Capello. There he is. He was up about a minute five on his team car of Emanuele Piro. Now he's up two and a half minutes on his team car and growing. Because moments ago, the team car suffered problems about three hours into the race, and it is now parked alongside the wall out on the course, now just beginning to move away from a scene of a crash a minute ago to try and limp back around into the pit area. Here's the car. And it was one of these things, and now he is on his way back around the track. It's really remarkable the car is even moving, because wait till you see the replay. This car absolutely slams the wall when he gets offline, tries to go around the outside of the Conrad car, loses grip. At this point, he knows he's in big trouble. Jump on the brakes and watch the impact. Look at the wham! The car rebounds off the wall. You see the sparks, and incredibly, we see the car moving. He was he got out of the car, he stopped, he took a look at it, and he's actually driving that thing back into the pits. He is creeping his way back toward the entry to pit road. You see the oh. front end askew, really grinding up the tires. 
He's out on the back stretch now, so he's still a half a lap away. He's a long he gets way back. back. Yeah. Onto pit road, and he's going to turn oh, it off. No. Now he's he's damaged something so severely that he's watching the gauges or monitoring something, and he has decided that he would do a lot more damage by continuing on. So. Now the five car you're looking at, just overtaken by the overall race leader, is Lucas Lohr, Dick Barber Racing Porsche, that is now the leader in the GT class, putting his teammate Dirk Muller in position to win the championship. Because a moment ago, just after a scheduled pit stop, Sasha Mawson in the 51 car, the point leader coming into the event, had a problem and came back down the pit lane. And we're guessing that this all goes back to the contact that Bob Wallach had when he was, was in contact with one of the Thanos cars. That was the corner of the car. You could see it like a little scuff back there. He cut the tire down and probably there's suspension damage. Martin Haven is down in the Dick Barber Racing pit area to find out what's going on down there with this car and that team's championship hopes. Martin? Bob Wallach, you'd only just handed the car over when Sasha brought it back in. They've got a gearbox on the floor. Is this going to be a gearbox change? Well, it takes too long to change the gearbox on this kind of car, and we lost the race anyway. But I just, I'm very unhappy because this championship should be a real professional championship, and it is not because the organizers are just not capable of keeping people bumping into each other. And we've lost several races this year, especially Mosport and here, because we have been bumped from behind. And this is not right, this is not racing. We should have won that championship. And we lost it because, again, the organizers are just not capable of getting people stopped to drive into each other. I mean, there's other way of driving than, than drive into each other. And it's unfortunate. Uh, a very emotional Bob Wallach, Sasha Masson, close to tears himself in the car. Guys, this is a tough way to lose one. Well, you know what? I have known Bob Wallach for a long time. I've never seen him that emotional, but I disagree 100% with him. I think he was the author of the incident where he was in contact with that car. The Panos was right up, and Wallach should have watched from the mirror. If he's so concerned about a championship, you've got to take care of the car. This is an endurance race. It's not a sprint race. It's one of the complicating factors of having the three different classes racing together. Yes. No matter what the racetrack. And Wallach, on the other side of that coin bill, Rough driving has been a big topic. The last couple of races in the series, Las Vegas, Laguna Seca, uh, we saw a lot of guys running into each other, more than you normally see in road racing. But I think that when you have the three classes of cars racing together, that's just it's gonna happen. Ab it definitely, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen in one class racing, and, and I, I understand Bob's disappointment. This is crushing to go through a whole season. Winning the American Le Mans Series Championship is tremendously prestigious and I know how badly he wanted to win it but this is his own fault. Lucas Lohr and his teammate Dirk Muller now in position to try and claim the GT Class Championship in the American Le Mans Series here in Adelaide. At Michelin we know there's only one safety feature on the road that actually touches the road. That's why we're introducing the Michelin Cross-Terrain SUV tire. Because we designed it specifically for SUVs, you get a level of handling and responsiveness you never thought possible in an SUV. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. How can you keep track of the latest in sports car racing? Monthly, with Le Mans and Sports Car Racer magazine. New from the publishers of F1 Racing and Autosport. Call 1-800-800-3921 to subscribe. It's the fastest way to keep track. Insightful columns, exclusive interviews, dazzling photography. Every month on Le Mans and Sports Car Racer magazine. New from the publishers of F1 Racing and Autosport. Call 1-800-800-3921 to subscribe. It's the fastest way to keep track. Traffic New York. Traffic Portland. Skyscrapers New York. Skyscrapers Portland. Rose Garden Portland. Madison Square Garden, New York. Some things are the same wherever you go. Two teams seeking the next level meet when the Knicks host the Blazers. The NBA on NBC, Saturday, January 13th. Thursday on NBC, don't miss an all-new evening of Must See TV. Ring of the New Year with brand new episodes of Friends, The Weber Show, Will and & Grace, and Just Shoot Me. 
It's all new Must See TV Thursday on NBC. The race of a thousand years from Adelaide, South Australia, season finale for the American Le Mans series. Highlight coverage here on NBC. Alan Bestwick with Bill Adam, Calvin Fish and Martin Haven down on Pit Road, a race that has been dominated by that 77 car, co-driven by Alan McNish and Dindo Capello. They have led since lap 17, <laughs> and we are now at lap 131. Yes, and they have been perfect. It's just, it's really remarkable, and I keep stressing this. The level of perfection these guys are showing, it is so much fun for the fans down here. They're getting to watch this virtuoso performance by the team and by two truly tremendous drivers. See if the speeds have changed any since A, they've got such a big lead, but B, we're now three hours and 15 minutes into a six hour race, past halfway. Darkness starting to creep around the edges of the Adelaide Just circuit barely. here. All right, now it's down below 30 miles an hour and then blasting down the start finish straight up to over 150 miles an hour. Now we're on board the Pinos again. This is the number 12 Pinos with local Australian driver Greg Murphy behind the wheel doing a really nice job. Now he is not used to driving these big horsepower cars, nothing like this, but really is at home and he's been running some very fast lap times. They're in a solid second place. First American Le Mans Series race for Murphy, a 28-year-old originally from Hastings, New Zealand. He's a two-time Bathurst 1000 race winner, one of the world's most demanding touring car races very successful in various series here in Australia since 1990. He is the teammate to David Brabham and another Australian uh, driver. Oh no, there's the, that, look at the front of the car. He is hard into the wall with the Olive Garden car. That is Norman Simon. No, he's not. Runoff area. Gosh, I thought the way the front end was kicked up there that he was into the wall. He's probably about ready to get out of that car. Oh, I'll bet he is at this point. Remember, he was, he was on board when the right front tire left the machine. This is the third place car. Let's have a look at what yeah, happened. No, let, let's just see now. Everything looking normal. This, oh, locking up a wheel. That's turn 14. One of the last of the 16 on the course. Oh, ah, good work. Really know. good. <laughs> I think he's good and lucky. All right, now he is on line here. Everything seems fine. He's still on line getting under braking. Now he's locked up. Look at the wheel. He turned hard on the steering wheel and the car was just going straight. So he had locked both front wheels at that point. Boy. That, that's when your heart rate doubles. Just about like that. So Norman Simon back on course. Managed to hold on to third position in the Raffinelli Lola. But he has had his share of adventures in the first half wow. of this race of a thousand years. Good job, Norman. Keep it going. Mr. Raffinelli has become one of our favorites, hasn't he? Yeah. A great character in racing, a man who just enjoys every aspect. Not his usual self this week. His voice has been missing him. This is the final race of the 2000 American Le Mans Series schedule. We look ahead to 2001 and a season that opens in about 90 days in Fort Worth, Texas. At the Texas Motor Speedway, you see a number of NBC races on the schedule for next season, including our first broadcast at Donington Park in England. Note that that race, the race in Yorama, Spain, all part of the European Le Mans series, though American Le Mans series drivers can and will race there and earn points as well. Mm -hmm. And the season concludes once again back here in Adelaide, Australia, a little bit earlier on the calendar, the beginning of the month of December, and that AP LMS means Asian Pacific Le Mans series. I can't wait to come back. Uh, it's, it's been a great week it, here in Adelaide. It is just remarkable. Everybody, we have all talked about the length of time it takes to get here, 22 or 23 hours of flying. But the bottom line is, it is worth it. Everything you've seen about South Australia, believe me, there is no way to express just how wonderful this is. These people know how to put on a race. Looking at Norman Simon back underway in the Olive Garden Raffinelli Lola. And that's supposed to their toolbox down on Pit Road. <laughs> Stand on podium. Mr. Raffinelli, like we say, he does enjoy his racing, and that has been his dream all year long. They had such a good race earlier this year in Silverstone. They went over there and found a track that suited their car and engine package perfectly. They qualified on the pole, had fast race lap, got robbed for a win by bad luck. That's been a rough season for this team. They continue to chase the Audi of Dudo Capello, who is out in front of the race of a thousand years. You're watching the American Le Mans series on NBC.
You want to race? Or just drive like you've never driven before? We've got the cars, we've got the tracks, we've got one cool school. The Pay Nose Racing School at Road Atlanta and Sebring International Raceway. Call us at 1-800-849-RACE. This is one cool school. College football's most electrifying player, Michael Vick, leads number five Virginia Tech versus Clemson in the Toyota Gator Bowl. New Year's Day at 12.30 Eastern on NBC. It's the race of a thousand years for the American Le Mans Series from Adelaide in South Australia. Our highlight coverage, we are three hours and 40 minutes into this six-hour race. You're riding with the leader, Dindo Capello, out in front of Mimo Scatarella and the Raffinelli Lola by nine laps in what has turned into a romp, partly because the rest of the field has been stepping on their toes. All he, of them have. He is going fast, but I'm seeing some signs of fatigue. Watch the helmet as he's under acceleration and deceleration. And notice the height of the helmet right here. Watch when he puts the brakes on up ahead. Look, squats down. Now when he gets under the, the gas pedal, watch. See it grow. He's pushing himself back in the seat. And look at the amount of side-to-side -side motion in the helmet. That is just the normal fatigue that starts to set in. But the more fatigue, the greater the chance of making an error. Capello has done most of the driving in this car. Alan McNish started the race, ran to the first pit stop, gave way to Capello, who has not given it up since. These cars very physically demanding to drive, especially on a tight street circuit like this. The curbs they've been bouncing over all day. He's got to be getting a little tired, which, with the theme of this race so far being mistakes and attrition, has got to concern the team. Yeah, although the one thing in his favor is, don't forget, he has that paddle shifting, where other drivers have to take one hand off the steering wheel to shift. Even though it's a fast shift with the, the, the uh, sequential boxes, he can just move his hands behind the steering wheel, never has to change up, so that helps him a lot. It has been a race of mistakes, people causing themselves problems that have taken them out of the race or out of contention. We've had a couple of more in the last few moments. We have a look now. This is Greg Murphy in the Pano's number 12 car. And he gets slightly offline and hard into the wall right where the Raffinelli car. Now watch his hands on the wheel here. He knows he's going off. He tries to turn the other way. And at this point, he's wishing he'd pull back on the wheel and fly over that wall. And inside the helmet, he said something we couldn't possibly repeat on television. He drove it back in. The NASCAR guys say if you can drive it back in, it doesn't count as a crash on your driving record. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> I don't um, know. He rearranged the toe in, toe out. So Murphy, in what was the second place car in trouble, here's the other remaining Pano's, Hiroki Kato, back in the garage. More of the same brake problems. They had a stuck throttle and a failing brake pedal earlier in the race, not once but twice. They get the hat trick for now. So. Rearranging the leaderboard because of Murphy's off in the Pano's. It is Capello leading now. Mimo Scatarella, who's up to second. Yes. Yeah, and this this could conceivably be the story of the year if the Raffinelli car can come back and win this race. I mentioned earlier they, they were our favorites all season long. It is a very flamboyant, fun group. They're very serious and they try their hearts out for a privateer effort to compete in this series with, with this type of competition from the good factory teams like Audi and BMW and Panos, it is virtually impossible. But Miss, I mean, their, their patron never gives up. He is a wonderful man. They are nine laps behind the leader, which would be demoralizing, except that this race has been one of such attrition yep. it would only take a nanosecond for Capello or McNish yep. to make a mistake in the lead Audi and their chance to win be thrown away. Their team car crashed earlier in the race. But he made a mistake trying to overtake a slower car into a corner, wound up pounding the wall hard, and they're out of the race. It could happen to the leader and the victory here to Scatterella and the Raffinelli team. Yeah, very easily. We just saw what happened to uh, Murphy in the Panos when he put himself into the wall just by being a foot or so offline, and it, it, it could happen. Looking back at some of the other cars who have crept their way into the top 10 by basically running clean races, this is Randy Popst in the 30 car. Not his normal ride during right. the bulk of the American Le Mans Series season. He drove for Alex Job racing most of the year. This is the White Lightning racing car, and Martin Haven can add more on the race of Randy Popes and his teammates. Martin? 
I think Martin's gone back to the winery or else down to Cooper's Brewery, one of the two. Well, we'll catch back up with him in just a minute. Randy, very pleased that the Alex Job Racing folks allowed him to come here to Australia. When they decided not to enter the event, they allowed him to drive for another team here, although it was still a Porsche. And Randy is running right now eighth overall and second in the GT class. Let's try Martin Haven once again. Guys, you said that it was avoiding trouble that has changed the front of the prototype class. It's the same here with the GTs. This car has run cleanly today. I asked the team, have you had any problems so far? They said, no, we've had all problems all year. Now maybe we'll get a clean run. <laughs> Been a clean run for them so far. They are three laps behind Lucas Lohr in the Dick Barber Racing portion. Now another problem for one of the BMWs stopped right here at pit exit. That is Bill Oberlin, ninth place overall. They had a problem earlier in the race, repaired it, came back out on track. Now it has cropped up again, and Oberlin has stopped. And he's uh, going to have to make another trip back to the garage. Heavy attrition in the race of a 1,000 years from Adelaide, Australia. Dindo Capello in the Audi R8 is the leader. We'll be back with more of the race of a 1,000 years after these words from our local stations. Tonight, 7, 6 Central, strap yourself in. Heroes who cheated death and lived to tell their stories. World's most amazing videos, NBC Tonight. Must see TV Tuesday, it's a special hour of Third Rock. The aliens are loose in New York. An hour of Third Rock starts 8, 7 Central, NBC Tuesday. coverage of the race of a thousand years new year's eve in adelaide australia some 76,000 race fans gathered to see the american the law series season conclude on the street circuit famed for its hosting of the australian grand prix years earlier these people have thrown a wonderful time for the competitors for us for their fans here in adelaide it's been a wonderful event in, in all of my years of racing of driving and watching and being at races i have never been at a better circuit from the, the reception the assistance that people give down here it, it's quite remarkable the race has been dominated by this car it is the audi r8 alan mcnish started dindo capello is behind the wheel now we are at three hours 55 minutes in our highlight coverage into this six hour race so just about the four hour mark mcnish did a double stint behind the wheel at the beginning of the race now capello is nearing the end of a double stint and we expect him to give up the lead and come to pit road at the conclusion of this lap and i think it's a good idea that once again you can really see capello's helmet moving around that his body fatigue is telling me that He's tiring. He needs to get out of that car and get a bit of a rest to get McNeish back in. McNeish, even though he's injured, he is just in such remarkably good physical shape. Okay, now we're approaching the track here. Let's see if he veers to the right to go down pit lane. Let's keep it up. Yes, he is. He's, he's bringing it in. He's coming into pits this lap. Remember that McNeish injured his back, stepping out of a kilt after a photo shoot earlier in the weekend. There was question whether he would race at all briefly. But Alan did start, has won the American Le Mans Series Championship for this year, and now his team has a nine-lap lead on second place. Let's go to Calvin Fish in the Audi pits. Ronaldo Capello hits his marks perfectly, and Alan McLeish leisurely strolls over there. He's going to ask Ronaldo to try and stick the seat insert in. This is the different size drivers. They have these seat inserts to try and help the drivers fit the car a little bit better, and then Alan is really going to take his time. You see how gingerly right now he's getting into the car. His teammate is going to try and help him slide in. I just had a word with Alan before he got into the car, and he said, I'm feeling pretty good, but he said, it's been such an emotional weekend. Friday was his birthday. He spent three hours in the hospital. His back was completely seized up. He didn't know whether, whether he'd be able to clinch this championship the weekend. And then he comes back after only four laps of running on this racetrack, does a double stint and almost laps his teammate. Just a phenomenal performance by the young Scotsman. So he's going to be moving on from sports car at the end of tonight, but he's certainly trying to leave his mark here with a win today. He will go out as champion. Nope, a little problem with the back support there. Yeah. He's getting back up out. Readjusting something. Something is just not quite right. You know, something that we have not addressed that I think we should have one of our reporters look into is when he was stepping out of the kilt, what was under the kilt? Maybe that's why he was hurrying. <laughs> I'm just not going there. Thank okay. you very much. It's been quite a season for McNish, who has won five times in 11 starts coming into the event. And remember that the Audis really didn't get rolling till after Le Mans when they brought the 2000 Boy. car to the American Le Mans series. They didn't have a lot of success in the first part of the season when they ran last year's car. But once they got through Le Mans and brought the 2000 car over to the yeah. U.S., 
They have just crushed the competition. They have indeed. I mean, we saw them make uh, uncharacteristic mistakes back at Charlotte. Uh, yep. Driver mistakes, not, not car mistakes. But since then, they have gelled so well that the team has just... It's so impressive. Look at a little Scottish flag right behind Allen's helmet there on the side. And that is the McNish Tartan as well alongside his helmet. And they would be more relaxed in getting Allen comfortable in the car and making sure all that seat adjusting was proper because they had a nine lap lead on second place yeah, when they and, came into the pit. And, so and, it wasn't a big rush. And again, something so important that once Allen is strapped into the car, he has these big wide seat belts holding his shoulders in place. The lap belt is very snug. So he doesn't move around a lot. As long as he is comfortable when he sits in the car in the pits, he's gonna be fine on the track. And we saw that earlier, his lap times are very consistent. They showed no signs at all of fatigue. Back earlier in the race at the three hour mark, the 78 car with Emanuele Piero that was running second at the time crashed out on the course. Piero abandoned the car in the back straightaway, but just moments ago, now nearly two hours later, <laughs> he's gotten, uh, I shouldn't say two hours, it's about, uh, what, an hour later, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. He's gotten back into the car and driven it around to pit road. Yeah, and I, I think it's probably a case of just getting a little bit offline. Again, to go back to what the Panos did, to go back to what uh, the Raffinelli car did, if you just vary your line fractionally, you get off the area of really good grip, and then you're into the marbles. And on a circuit like this that is notorious for that, that's all it takes. But he abandoned the car for an hour, then got sent back out to bring it back in. Don't know what they have to gain if they fix it and come back in the race at this point, but we'll keep our eyes on that. Highlight coverage of the Race of a Thousand Years for the American Le Mans Series on NBC. Maruk. Anuk. Audi. Quattro. At Michelin, we know there's only one safety feature on the road that actually touches the road. That's why we're introducing the Michelin Cross-Terrain SUV tire. Because we designed it specifically for SUVs, you get a level of handling and responsiveness you never thought possible in an SUV. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, David Duvall, and more in a test to see who's best. The exciting conclusion of the EMC Golf Skills Challenge next. The NBA, the NBA on NBC returns Saturday, January 13th with more exciting action. Most of you will see a battle of two powerhouse teams looking to make it to the next level. The Scotty Pippen and the Blazers face off against Latrell Sprewell and the Knicks. Others will see Jason Kidd in Phoenix versus Dirk Nowitzki and the surprising Dallas Mavericks. Check your local listings for the game in your area. It's the NBA on NBC, Saturday, January 13th. Now, is that beautiful? Wow. Sun beginning to set. In the race of a 1,000 years, Adelaide, Australia, highlight coverage of this six-hour race on NBC, four hours and 25 minutes into the distance now. Here's your race leader. It is Alan McNish in this car that has led. Check this out. Now, I just said we're four hours and 25 minutes in. They took the lead at the 24-minute mark and are up by eight laps on second place. It has been massively impressive. It, it is, it, there's no way to overstate just how good this performance is right now. And Allen continues to go very quickly. Right ahead of this car, the Olive Garden car. Uh, this is uh, Mimo Scatterella back in the car now. And he really has put in a good performance as well. He is running a little bit slower than Allen at this point. McNish has slowed his pace down about six seconds a lap, which, as funny as it sounds, may be the most dangerous time of the race for him. Because sometimes, as a driver, when you back off a little bit, you lose that all-important concentration. And then your, your, your tendency is to make more little mistakes. Great shot of the Brabham straight away, leading into the hairpin. Final few corners on this 16 turn, 2.3 mile course on the streets and in the East Parklands of Adelaide, Australia. The part they're running in now is actually on the infield of a horse racing track. Yes. The pit complex in this several turn complex here is actually in the infield of a horse racing 
removal that was just in use about, what, a week ago? Yeah, and again, you, you, you notice how smooth it is. See how little vibration is off the headlights and the cars are going around here. Just a remarkable track. All of the tracks that we have in North America, all of the street circuits, are typically very bumpy. In third place, the Conrad car. Now this, this really is a shock. This is a privateer team that is up in position to grab a podium finish now. Australian driver behind the wheel for the moment. Late add to the team, Alan Heath is behind the wheel. And let's go get more on the Conrad Racing Team's effort. Calvin? Well, indeed, it is a great story, Alan. Alan Heath from Adelaide, actually. The local boy is running third in his first sports car race with Conrad Motorsports. But it makes this man really proud. Franz Conrad, you've been a longtime sports car supporter of this series. You're coming over competing against the likes of Audi and Panos. How does it make you feel to have a chance of a podium here in the final race of the year? Yeah, that would be wonderful for us. Uh, we'll be a small crew, and uh, the crew did a good job. I have a good driver, Alan did a good job. And uh, I'm really happy, and I just came out of the car. The car is perfect, so I crossed my finger and hope the car holds the last one and a half hour, and then we can get on a podium that would be wonderful. There's some great stories developing here tonight, guys, and we're looking forward to see if these guys can finish on the podium for the first time this year. So the Conrad car, and Alan Heath running in third overall now. This is your GT class leader. Behind the wheel of the Dick Barber Porsche, Dirk Muller. He's sixth overall. He is a lap and a minute up on the second place car in GT class. And Martin Haven is with Muller's co-driver now down on pit road. Lucas Lua, you just stepped out of the number five car. It had a, an early pit stop in the first hour of the race. No problem so far? Uh, the first hour, we had some temperature problems. Now uh, the mechanics put some oil in because we forgot to get that at the first stint. But so far, so well, everything is okay. How much harder will it be for Dirk Muller now that the sun is going down and it's hard to see? Will it be hard to drive now that it's hard to see? No, it's not a big deal. It's just here in turn one where it's a little bit dark. All the rest from the circuit you can see pretty good. So they've got to avoid problems. Everybody else, it seems, in the whole field apart from Audi has had trouble. But they're looking for the top of the podium and the championship win. Yeah, this is really the time of night where they have to be so careful. But you know yourself, when you're in your street car and you've been driving for a couple of hours or a couple of hundred miles, you get tired and you start looking at bright lights in your mirror, you lose a little bit of concentration. This is magnified so much. And as you can see, the sun has huh. just set. We have a spectacular evening here. It's just beautiful. But unfortunately, the, the drivers don't get a chance to appreciate this like we do right now. Remember, this is Australian summer. It has been a very warm day here. Now that beating sun beginning to give way to a beautiful evening. The conclusion of the race of a thousand years. Coming up on NBC, Alan McNish is your leader in the Audi R8. At Michelin, we know there's only one safety feature on the road that actually touches the road. That's why we're introducing the Michelin Cross-Terrain SUV Tire. Because we designed it specifically for SUVs, you get a level of handling and responsiveness you never thought possible in an SUV. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. What would happen if an SUV were raised by a family of sports cars? Zoom, zoom. Zoom, zoom. Introducing the 200 horsepower Mazda Tribute. The SUV with the soul of a sports car. How can you keep track of the latest in sports car racing? Monthly with Le Mans and Sports Car Racer Magazine. New from the publishers of F1 Racing and Autosport. Call 1-800-800-3921 to subscribe. It's the fastest way to keep track. Insightful columns, exclusive interviews, dazzling photography. Every month from Le Mans and Sports Car Racer Magazine. New from the publishers of F1 Racing and Autosport. Call 1-800-800-3921 to subscribe. It's the fastest way to keep track. Do you remember why you fell in love with football? Touchdown dance. Miracle comeback. Great personalities like Snake, Hacksaw, and Billy White Shoes. Money uniforms. Tailgate parties in the snow. Football isn't supposed to be clean and neat. Football is supposed to be fun. On February 3rd, it will be again. The XFL, NBC February. 
The race of a thousand years in Adelaide, South Australia, down to its final 30 minutes as we bring you highlight coverage of this six-hour race on NBC. Darkness has settled over the Adelaide circuit now. You're riding with the leader, Alan McNish, on board the Audi R8 that is putting in, and I don't think this is an overstatement, Bill, one of the most dominating performances ever seen in endurance racing. I definitely agree, both by car and driver. It is really, really tremendous that Alan McNish continues to do this Iron Man performance. He does have this very sore back, and he is driving flawlessly. We keep watching and talking about his, his ability to pick up apexes and make these instantaneous decisions on where to pass safely and also how to avoid other cars who haven't chosen to make safe passes. He's just, he is a master. Now you saw that graphic on Team Audi who have led every lap today, but this particular car with McNish and his co-driver Dindo Capello took the lead at lap number 17. We're now at lap 205. They've led them all. And it's 189 a laps, excuse me, Bill, 189 laps in a row that they've led. The previous longest, the single car has led this season, was 145 laps by this car right. in Petit Le Mans at Road Atlanta. Yeah, th this has not been an easy victory for them either. They have continued to push very hard and uh, in, in less than perfect conditions. When you get onto a circuit like this, as good as it is, as smooth as this track is and as, as perfect as it is, look at the view you get. I mean, by anybody's definition, this is very difficult driving. And he's up there, he'll be up to 175 miles an hour in just a moment. We mentioned that this has been a race of attrition several times. We've had some more bumps, bangs, and bruises in the last few moments. First, though, some decision or indecision on the part of the leader. This is the pit message board to McNish from the crew. It appears that he's having some radio troubles. Otherwise, they would just have called him and said, is everything all right? But they didn't. Then they give him a word that Dindo, his co-driver, is ready in case. So Alan goes by. He gives a little signal to them saying, I'm fine, guys. I'm going to stay in the car. And then heartbreak for the second uh, place car. Didier Deronagas, drive line failure in turn number six. While running second, he stopped on course. He's out of the race. Another of the P cars, prototype cars, that's had some problems earlier today, finds it again. This is the Pinos of Jason Bright. Not the way he wanted to finish his day. It's hard to tell. We, we really don't know at this point, but he came off that corner, and just as he moved his right hand down to the gear shift, the car suddenly snapped out. Then he compounded the problem by overcracking with the steering wheel, and the car snapped over to the left and hard into the barrier. Brought out the pace car for the what has been only full course caution of this event. That gave the leader the opportunity to make a leisurely pit stop under the yellow flag. And McNish made the decision, I'm staying in. A couple of hand signals over to one of his engineers saying that he can't hear, couldn't see very well, but there he is. He's back out there going fast. And again, just take a moment to appreciate what he is doing by looking at, the, at their lack of vision to be more, most accurate. You see the race recap. Surprisingly, only six cars out of the race. We had several behind the wall early. Thought this was going to be a, a race of heavy attrition. It's been a race of heavy mistakes and heavy mechanical failures, but yeah. everyone's been able to make the repairs, except a few, and get back in. Here we are down the end of the straight. The crocodile car and the disc brakes glowing red. These are the carbon rotors. It is so beautiful. We saw them glow red in the, in the bright light of the day. And at night, this is just spectacular. It is art in motion. McNish is up by 21 laps over the new second place car, which is Franz Conrad, who we talked to just a short while ago on board his privateer Lola Ford. So they're in second now. And then the GTS class leader is up to third overall. It is Dominic Dupuy in the 91 car, the uh, Chrysler Viper, shared with Olivier Beretta and Carl Venlinger, their team car running on the same lap, but we suspect there are some team orders there yeah. to let the champion Beretta win the race as the Viper goes out sports car competition when the checkered flag falls in this one. And this gives you a lot of appreciation for just how good Alan McNish is. Watch the speed and then look up ahead and imagine, okay, are you really capable of doing 70, 80 miles an hour? Where do you turn in? Where's the apex? You can't see a thing, but Alan is doing this so perfectly. From where the day started for this team with the car crashed into the barrier right about there on the racetrack in the warm-up. Repaired expertly by the Audi team, starting from scratch with a driver yeah. with a sore back who hadn't been on a bed in two days. It has been a flawless race for them so far. They have led now since the 24-minute mark of this race, and we're closing in on the finish of this six-hour race of a thousand years. Stay with us. We're back for the checkers on NBC. No matter where we go in life,
We each take a part of our family with us. They are nurturing and caring. Their unique way of seeing the world. Our families give us the courage to be curious and the heart to have hope. They teach us how important it is to laugh and what it's like to be loved every single day. Here's to the places where inspiration is born, to families big and small, with thanks for making our family such a welcome part of yours. Olive Garden, when you're here, your family. Amaruk. Anuk. Audi, Quattro. The Pay Nose Racing School at Road Atlanta and Sebring International Raceway. 1 888 282 GTRA. This American Le Mans series is brought to you by the Olive Garden. When you're here, your family. And by Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. The race of a thousand years from Adelaide, South Australia. A six hour race, our highlight coverage here on NBC, down now to its final two minutes. And you're riding with the man who'd win the race, even if he pulled over and parked it right now, Alan <laughs> McNish, the Scotsman. He has just done such a job today. I'm sure he's not gonna pull over that. He's just gritted his teeth and he's gone through probably enormous pain sitting in this car, but he refuses to give up. He just is on a quest and, Oop. oh, somebody just spun there. And you see, even with one minute to go, he probably doesn't want to have a, a, a lapse in concentration. While McNish is going to win the race by some 21 laps, the second place driver and team on the podium will be quite the story. The privateer Conrad Motorsport team brought their Lola here. Franz Conrad, a longtime sports car competitor. He and a couple of other drivers teaming up. There's the second place car. Uh, his team drivers, Charles Slater, former owner of a sports car sanctioning organization. Yes. And Alan Heath, an Adelaide, Australia driver, a late add to the team. They crashed this car heavily on Friday, put it back together. They're going to come up with a second place finish, by far their best result since Conrad took his team to prototype competition. And for McNish, he rockets around this Adelaide circuit in the dark for the final couple of times. In fact, this may be the final lap of the race, depending, it's a timed event. And yes, we see the checkered flag in the starter's hand now, so when he comes back around, he will get the checkered flag. Look at him flashing the lights to salute the fans as he begins the celebration of his win and his championship. The end of the Brabham straight, final few quarters for McNish, and the Audi team will score. I've enjoyed uh, watching Alan so much this year, and I've enjoyed chatting with him because he's just one of the most delightful personalities. He's very serious and very intense and, and driven to perfection, and yet he approaches racing with this just a great sense of enjoyment, and you can tell it's special to him. Of 12 races in the season, a sixth win for Alan McNish, the Scotsman, and his teammate, Dindo Capello, checkered flag. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> and the race of a thousand years, the American Le Mans Series Championship have been won by Alan McNish. Oh, boy, what a performance. Both hands up in the air as he crossed the line. There you can see this waving in the dark. This is the moment. Now you, you can actually relax. In a car at a time like this, you can relax your concentration kind of come back and, and start to savor the moment. Even on your final lap, I'm sure that Alan wasn't doing that, but at this point, it's an explosion of emotion for him. Finished first or second in the last eight races of the season, out of 12 total. There's the second place car, Franz Conrad, going to take the checkered flag for his team. Be a very proud moment for them to be on podium. Outstanding achievement. We almost had two privateers, the Raffinelli team and Franz Conrad, come in with real performance today and Viper win the GTS class once again. Cars coming around on the cool down lap. Some still trying to finish the race. There is the GTS race winner. 
with Dominic Dupuis taking the checkers, and now the GT class champions about to take the checkered flag. Dirk Muller is going to get the finish, fifth overall, first in the GT class, and he's going to become the series champion. There's Dupuis. Olivier Beretta locking up the series championship for a second straight year, and this is a pretty historic moment for the Viper team because it is. it is the finish of the last race that these cars will compete in, and they've been so dominant since they came out in the Moss competition. You know, you think it's really historic in so many different aspects that we are losing Alan McNeish. He'll be going over to uh, Formula One testing with uh, Toyota. We're losing Dirk Mueller from Porsche. He will be going to BMW next year. And just on and on and on, of course, the Vipers, they will probably end up in privateer hands along with a number of other cars next year. Muir, the GT Clash champion, as a result of his win and problems for his teammates earlier in the night. And McNish coming back around to the front stretch, to the victory celebrations in the podium. He missed the pit road opening. <laughs> that is, that's the only mistake he's made all day long. It is. Amazing. He's got to spin it around and go back. Oh, that's funny. He's been perfect all race long <laughs> till now. Of this uh, five hour and 45 minute race, this team led five hours and 21 minutes. This is great. Dominance from McNish and Capello. Brad Jones did not get behind the wheel of the car through the course of this race. He was the Aussie driver called in as the standby in case McNish's back prevented him from going. He'll get an attaboy for being willing to help, but it was McNish and Capello doing the driving. As you look at the rundown, of the race of a thousand years from Adelaide in South Australia. The zero car, the Raffinelli Lola dropping out late with driveline problems. Some of the cars now that failed to finish, including the 2001 Pedos that only made two laps. And the fireworks have started. Here we go. In the sky and <laughs> in the pits. <laughs> saluting their drivers, saluting the Adelaide fans. Oh, boy. As the fireworks go off overhead, it is New Year's Eve. Look Here. at the fans. Look, look at the stands. They yeah. are still jammed with people. There's Olivier Beretta, GTS winner and champion for 2000. The victory celebrations are just beginning. We'll be back to speak to our winners and champions in just a moment. We'll wrap up our race of a thousand years coverage from Adelaide after we go to New York and the South America Sports Desk. Stay with us. This is the Sun America NBC Sports Desk. Here's Ahmad Rashad. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our New York studio. We'll return to Adelaide for the conclusion of our Le Mans coverage shortly. In the NFL playoffs today, the Baltimore Ravens played their first ever postseason game against the Denver Broncos in an AFC wildcard game. Jamal Lewis rushed for 110 yards and two touchdowns, and former Broncos Shannon Sharp scored on a 58-yard touchdown reception, which was more than enough offense for the league's number one defense. Ravens win it 21-3. Baltimore will play the Titans next weekend in Tennessee. See. Turning to college football, tomorrow's Gator Bowl here on NBC features two of the game's most dynamic quarterbacks, Clemson's Woody Danzler and Michael Vick of Virginia Tech. Rolling to his right, sprinting towards that end zone, cuts back, dives, airborne, somersault, touchdown, Tech! It's the Michael Vick show. The kid is just insane. Crosses the 50, turning on the Jets. Look at that speed! He's wowing the Hokey fans. He's wowing Vic is sensational. Woody is kind of a miniature Michael Vick. There are similarities in weight and size, quickness, and speed. You chisel the other guy down a little bit in every department, you've got Woody. So it's the 16th ranked Clemson Tigers and the number six Hokies in the Toyota Gator Bowl. Our coverage begins tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. I will see you a little later during our golf coverage. Now let's send you back to Adelaide for post-race interviews. This has been the Sun America NBC Sports Desk. Sun America, the retirement specialist. In the aftermath of the race of a thousand years, it is quite the scene here in Adelaide. Well, this is magic. It, it simply put is the best, and I am so grateful to be here. 
Fans have stormed the front straightaway to get close to the victory celebrations. And let's jump down into the middle of all of the champagne spraying now. Here's Martin Haven. Thank you, Alan. Well, despite the fact that he's had a crook back for the last couple of days, Alan McNish winning the championship, winning the race. You're wincing a little, but actually, you don't look half bad. No, the car was very good all day. Um, and to be honest with you, the last run was relatively simple because we already had an eight-lap lead. And it's a case of trying to bring the car home. But the hard work was done at the beginning. And overall, I would have to say that uh, we've had a fantastic season. And I couldn't have had a better teammate and a better team than Audi with Dindo Capello. Party hard tonight? Well, we'll certainly be partying, that's for sure. I'm sure it'll be a little bit easier tomorrow. Alan McNish winning the prototype class and the championship. Callum, uh, Calvin Fish is with Olivier Beretta. Olivier has been such an incredible three or four years for you and the team. The final race for the Viper. You take another win here tonight. I think it's 45 for Team Orica. Your fourth driver championship here and in Europe. What are your feelings as you retire this car? I mean, it's, I have a strange feeling because this car has been so great for me that uh, I have a lot of satisfaction. And I was very lucky to have Carl and Dominique. We have a lot of success. We have won Daytona and many championships, many races. I think I have won 39 races in total. And uh, I mean, the, the, the Chrysler Viper has done a fantastic historic uh, challenge because winning the overall in Daytona, the LMS championship, the FIA, and three times Le Mans, I mean, it's great. Like I said, thanks to Oreca, Michelin tires, and, and very good, good job. Good well, job. the parties are about to begin here, but there's a little less clicker in the GT category, Martin. It was a race all the way to the end. Dirk Muller, uh, the Dick Barber Racing Team, won the race, won the title with you and Lucas Lure. I, it's unbelievable. I don't know what to say at the moment. First of all, I really thank my teammate Lucas Lure. He did a tremendous job. And um, I also thank Dick Barber for the great car. Michelin tires lasted very well. And um, I'm, I'm really, really happy. I don't know what to say. I was in the car and I was like, oh, how long is that race going on? I don't know. But I'm really happy. Excellent. Well, three very happy teams and anybody who survived this one, Alan, I think has got to be very pleased with themselves as well. Yeah, it was a race of attrition, that's for sure. It was, and yet we're so lucky. We have seen three just superbly talented drivers driving perhaps the most beautiful race cars ever. All three race winners take their division's championships for the American Le Mans Series of 2000. There's the Audi R8 that has dominated this division since it was rolled out mid-year. There's the Porsche of Dirk Muller, and you saw the Dodge Viper of Olivier Beretta earlier, the three series champions in 2000 in the American Le Mans Series. Well, we've had a lot of fun covering these races in 2000, and be sure to join NBC Sports on Sunday, April 14th, as our motorsports coverage continues with the 2001 American Le Mans Series from Donington Park in England. Up next on NBC, stay tuned as some of golf's greatest compete in the exciting conclusion of the EMC Skills Challenge. For Bill Adam, Martin Haven, and Calvin Fish, I'm Alan Bestwick saying Happy New Year. From the race of a thousand years in Adelaide, Australia, your winner, Alan McNish, is the 2000 American Le Mans Series champion. You've been watching the American Le Mans Series on NBC.